Yeah, thank you, Lorenzo. Sorry. Uh, okay, let me start the timer. You can hear me okay? Yeah, okay. I'm looking at Janet and encouraged by her uh, positivity. Um, so, thank you to the organizers for having me speak here. Um, uh, and with the Riken and uh, Matsuoka sons, uh, talk earlier about uh, connecting the quantum computer and the HPC sort of very high level systems talk. I'm, that's sort of a tough act to follow because I'm sort of coming at this from the other end. Okay, well, I'm not yet thinking about even the connections to the HPC whatsoever. We are really thinking about still as many of us here are uh, doing at the moment. We're still thinking about how in the world am I going to make that quantum computer work the way we want it to. Yeah, okay. So my um, own background, I've been working for a long time on narrow correction and fault tolerant quantum computing. And um, for the longest time, that subject was something that was highly theoretical, highly mathematical, where, uh, because I did this during my PhD years when we didn't have any sign of uh, what a quantum computer, what a physical quantum computer device might actually look like. Okay, so a lot of the discussion that we have had is really about suppose the quantum computer looks like this, what can we do about it to make it fault tolerant? What can we do about it to make you able to scale up your quantum computation for useful problem sizes? Okay, so that is sort of where I'm coming from, um, sort of my background on this. Now, in the past uh, couple of years or so, what I've been trying to do and what I've been trying to get my group to do and also uh, together with my wonderful collaborators uh, who are the organizers of this um, event is to really think a little bit more about getting, uh, bringing the fault tolerant quantum computation theory closer to the experimental reality, okay, where you're really thinking about um, not just this mathematical theory that I was talking about, but really thinking about how do you put in some of the hardware knowledge that we have today, because we do know what the shape of some of these quantum devices look like today. So how do you actually put in some of the hardware knowledge to try to simplify some of the error correction, some of the fault tolerance quantum computing uh, ideas that we have, okay? I can tell you this has been a very difficult journey, okay? Many of the experimental things are difficult to come by. Many of them are still rather uncertain. And then the fault tolerant theory side of it is uh, somewhat, well, I would say idealistic, you know? okay? So actually the, the main thing I will talk about today, because my title still says energy costs of quantum technologies, you know, um, I was hoping for this to be very much in line with the uh, conference that we have today. So a large piece of what I'm going to talk about today really arose initially as from my side of this is to think about what kind of assumptions that we're putting into the standard for tolerant quantum computing theory, what, what kind of assumptions there are actually not true in practice, okay? One of the main piece that is not true in practice that we assume right from the beginning, first page of any fault tolerant quantum computing theory is that you will assume usually that the noise in your quantum computing system remains constant as you scale up your machine. Okay, this is what people talk about when you are talking about scalability of your quantum device. Yeah? So you assume that the noise stays constant, noise per device, uh, noise per component, I should say, actually stays constant as you scale up your machine. In practice, you look at the things that we have today, the IBM machines, the Google machines, um, probably the Recan machines, I would guess, uh, that you are setting up right now, you don't actually have that property. Usually what happens is that the larger your devices are, because of the complexity of the calibration procedure, because of the complexity of actually putting the device, the larger device together, you'll find that your noise is going to increase, okay? So I come into this really thinking about, so suppose you have now this sort of a scale-dependent noise, noise increases, noise per component increases as you scale your quantum computer, how does it actually change your fault tolerant quantum computing um, uh, conclusions, okay? And then, I'm coming back to sort of my title slide now because uh, I now look at uh, Rob and Alexia because at that time when I was thinking about this, uh, well, three years ago by now, I suppose. Yeah. Um, I, and they had, uh, they had in fact given me sort of the physical, uh, the typical physical reasoning why is it that your noise actually increases 
as you try to scale your computer, and usually that comes from some sort of uh, resource constraints, or as they would uh, like uh, in the context of this uh, conference, would be say some sort of an energy constraint. Yeah. Okay. So that's actually what I'm going to talk about for the main part of it, and that's um, that's what these two papers are really about. Okay. And then the second, the last piece of I wanted to mention a little bit at the end, also. That's why I put energy cost of quantum technologies and not quantum computers is because at the end, I wanted to mention a little bit of work that uh, my, uh, well, he was an intern, but you'll become a PhD student soon. And then I have Ying Long in the audience. Yeah, together with Alexia, we have recently been thinking about extending some of these energy cost ideas to quantum metrology, uh, quantum metrology uh, topics. Huh? Okay. So let me get started a little bit. Um, So this is sort of the overview, which I've already said uh, a little bit of it. So I will start by talking a little bit about what fault-tolerant quantum computing is, um, because I am aware that quite a few of you in the audience may not be so somewhat familiar with the subject. And then I will talk about really the reality of it, which is what I said already. I motivated this already. I talk about resource constraints, and then hence you have this sort of scale-dependent noise. And I will talk about what are then the limitations on the kind of quantum computation you can do, even with so-called fantastic fault-tolerant ideas. Huh? Then I will turn this around um, to the, so the limitations, like the bad news, the good news part of it is that I can turn this kind of ideas of connecting scale-dependent noise with uh, accuracy of quantum computation to think about optimizing your quantum computers. I will mention this part only briefly because Marco, who is my fantastic co-author sitting in the audience, he will talk about this uh, after the tea break uh, in a much more detailed manner. Huh? So I'll only just mention this optimization part. And then finally, I will go to this thing about the energy cost of quantum metrology. OK, so let me get started with this. So well, we all know this, huh? this uh, promise of quantum computers where you can have all the fantastic words that you want to have, second quantum revolution, supremacy, advantage, reversible computing, and everything. Yeah? Right. The question, of course, is how do you actually get there? Right now, we have what we call NIST devices, noisy, uh, intermediate scale, meaning they're not that large, okay? and hopefully something quantum in them. Okay, That's what the Q is all, no? Yeah. Okay, but the goal, of course, is you want to have low noise, devices that are scalable. Yeah? And um, you want them so that you're able to really do quantum computation in a manner that is accurate. Yeah? And the standard route to this, at least this is the only way we know about how to uh, build a large scale accurate quantum computer, is really what you call fault tolerant quantum computing. Okay? Well, what you do there is that you first assume as a sort of a basic ingredient that you need to have, this so-called threshold that we'll mention a little bit later. You need to have low noise physical components, and you do uh, error, active error removal, okay, as you are carrying out your quantum computation. And so you need both of these pieces. You first, the step one is to improve your physical components, and I'm looking at all the experimentalists that are sitting in the audience. This is really on, on you. You have to design in the first place better qubits, better gaze, better measurements. The physical hardware needs to be good enough, okay? Once you get to the stage where you're actually good enough, so so called below the threshold, then you can improve your accuracy further by active error removal. Okay, and this is what quantum error correction is really about. And all these subjects of surface codes, concatenator codes, or the bosonic codes that people um, talk about a lot these days. Now the error removal part, so I'm sort of assuming step one already, yeah? okay? Because nothing I can do about that, um, although I, I, I do want to learn a lot more about it. So I'm focusing really on the step two part of it, where now I'm talking about um, error removal to try to, what you want to do is you want to be able to have the ability to correct more errors so that your computation in the end is more accurate. Yeah? The way you correct more errors is to, of course, have more and more powerful quantum, uh, quantum error correction methods, and that requires more physical resources. Okay? You need to have more qubits to be able to carry, to introduce sufficient redundancy into your quantum informational uh, carrying um, device. You need more gates to be able to actively detect what the errors are and then do error correction. 
Okay, and all of that then requires more energy, more power, probably more space, so that you have uh, the ability to accommodate more qubits. So, um, this is just sort of to summarize where we are right now. Right now we are at this NISC prototype stage, and you want to go to genuinely useful quantum computers able to solve some of these problems, some of these real world problems that your classical computer cannot. What you need to do in order to get there, as I've said, is to increase the physical resources that you invest to be able to remove more and more errors. Okay? So I'm talking here not about scaling up the problem size. This is one thing I want to emphasize. I'm talking about for the same problem, for the same task you want your quantum computer to do, you want to increase the accuracy. What you need to do is you need to scale up the physical size of your quantum computer. Okay, because you want to be able to do more error correction, remove more errors, then hence you need more, a lot more investment of physical resources. No? So for the same problem size, you want it to be more accurate, you put in more resources. Makes sense, huh? Okay. So I nowadays like to, um, especially for this sort of audience, where we talk about energy constraints and uh, energy costs, I like to think of fault-tolerant quantum computing really as the link between the noise, the physical resource, and then the computational accuracy or what Alexia nowadays likes to talk about as the noise, resource, and then the metric. You know, in my case, usually the metric is computational accuracy. Yeah? Okay. And you can see this sort of uh, link uh, in photon quantum computation in a sort of, uh, somewhat standard formula that you find in many kinds of um, uh, photon quantum computation schemes. Here I sort of bring up one that is uh, 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 you can talk about this as the textbook example of photon quantum computing. And uh, where you use a seven qubit code and then you talk about how you build uh, larger and larger, um, you use a larger and larger scale code to be able to correct more and more errors and to do more and more accurate computation. No? And the standard formula that you find, not just for the seven qubit code, but actually applies for surface codes and many other kinds of situation, is that you will have usually some sort of, on the left-hand side of this, is something that tells you about the computational error rate or what uh, error correction people will talk about as the logical error rate, okay? So you have some probability P of having an error. The K here, this is uh, the parameter that you were set. This determines the scale of your computer. It also, in this sort of error correction language, it determines how much error correction you're going to do, what is the size of the error correcting code that you're gonna use. Okay, so the K determines the scale, and it hence tells you also about how many physical components, gates, qubits, um, or the wires that you need, per computational gates that you want to do. Huh? Okay, that's what scale the K is. And then on the right hand side, what you have is actually both the noise part as well as the extra physical resources you need to put in because you're doing error correction, huh? okay? So the noise here, eta here, you can think of this as a physical error probability, if you like, okay? And then this is where actually all the physics of your device really enters. The B here, what is this B here? The B here captures what you are uh, putting in as the extra, uh, where you introduce some sort of extra complexity, and I mean that in the English sense of the word, now not the computational sense of the word. You, introduce into your circuit extra complexity because you want to be able to have extra qubits, extra gate, extra operations that allows you to do the error correction, okay? So rather than doing a single computational gate, every single computational gate now translates into a larger circuit that incorporates the error correction operations in it, huh? okay? So that's what this B actually is capturing. It's capturing how much you have sort of complicated your circuit in order to be able to remove errors and hence do a more accurate calculation, okay? So in that sense, this is the physical resources that you need to invest in order to be able to improve um, the accuracy, okay? So in any photon quantum computing scheme, you will have a, a, a formula that looks like this. The fact that it goes as to the power of k has to do with the fact that I'm using some sort of concatenated code, but there will always be some sort of a scaling on the right-hand side that tells you that, uh, hopefully, that this probability decreases as k increases for whatever code that you have that is, uh, you're using as the basis for your um, fault tolerance scheme. No? Now, um, 
Let me talk about uh, the noise threshold because this is sort of where I'm getting towards um, being able to discuss the scale dependent noise. I'm just looking at the time. Yeah. So, uh, what you need for the entire fault tolerant computing to work for that previous formula that I shown to uh, for the p to decrease as k increases, what you actually need is something that is known as uh, the threshold condition, and this is I wanted to spend a, a minute or so to explain this. So I've already said you want to scale up your quantum computer, you need to scale up your computers. Uh, you, you want to scale up your error correction, you need to scale up your quantum computer size. Okay. The benefit of scaling up is that you can remove now more errors. Okay. There is, however, a cost because you now have a larger scale computer, many, many more physical components, and hence many, many more ways your computer can go wrong. Okay. So any one of those larger number of physical components can actually give you errors as well. So the fault tolerant quantum computing scheme is really about how the benefit grows. Okay, that, that, that the scheme itself tells you how the benefit itself grows, and then your physical device properties tells you how does the noise per physical component uh, grows, and that's the cost part of it. Huh? Okay. So what you want to be, where you want to be, really is that you need to be at a place where your benefit is greater than the cost. Yes, otherwise you just shouldn't think about doing this fault tolerant thing at, at all, right? So your benefit is greater than the cost only if the noise per physical component is low enough, low be below some certain threshold so that when you increase the scale, you can increase the accuracy without any limit. No? So this is sort of explained by this very simple uh, picture that I have, where the benefit grows according to the computer size k, okay? And this is determined by your fault tolerant quantum computing scheme. Then the cost, which is the noise per component, actually also grows as well because your computer is just getting larger. So the cost for the component, actually this is the cost for the total computer itself. The cost also grows and then depending on where you are, your physical device might be in this region or versus this region. If you are here, you actually, it's good news because your uh, fault tolerant quantum computer will work. Your benefit is higher than the cost, but if you're, you're sort of um, in a bad shape. Huh? Okay, so that itself determines what this threshold is. And then I come back to this uh, picture itself, this formula that I had earlier, where Again, what I want to do is that if I want to increase k, I want this p of k to actually be decreasing so that my error probability is smaller and hence higher accuracy, right? So if I look at the formula on the right, k increases. In order for this to actually decrease, what I need is that I need this b eta, um, this product to in fact be less than one, yeah? And eta comes from, the, again, the noise. B tells you about the extra resources that you need to invest. And then this relationship, eta times B is less than one, actually gives you what the noise threshold really is. Huh? Okay? So this is how you usually get this noise threshold. And then, of course, I've already said this. This is what we assume as the basic ingredients for fault tolerant quantum computing. We assume that the eta, this noise per component, is constant, independent of the computer size. Huh? Okay? The experimental reality, of course, is that the noise really increases usually, at least right now, as the computer size increases, so that you have the situation of a scale-dependent noise. And the typical setting where this happens is really because you are requiring more, because you're requiring more physical resources to do um, error correction. But if you have some sort of a total resource constraint, this might be a space issue, this might be a total energy issue, okay? The resource that you have to invest per component actually can decrease as the scale increases. Yeah? When your resource per physical component decreases, uh, usually this leads to some sort of increase in noise per physical component. Huh? Okay? Let me bring up the picture actually. So earlier I had this benefit and the costs are growing linearly. Once you have scale dependent noise, what this means is that the cost graph actually starts off the same and then it rapidly increases uh, in this manner because you have the situation where your noise per component is increasing. So as you grow your computer larger and larger, actually your total amount of noise gets bigger and bigger. This gives you this pink graph that goes straight up. Huh? Okay? And the consequence of this is that there is a region, there is sort of a place where is uh, the maximum difference between the benefit and the cost, and then this gives you then the limit to your accuracy of your computer. 
compared to the previous situation where you have just straight lines where the uh, accuracy just increases without a limit now. Okay, so you have now a limit to your achievable uh, accuracy. So in the paper where I don't, uh, I don't actually want to talk about these uh, examples in detail, you can come out and ask me about this later on, but it's all in this 2021 uh, paper that we have uh, together with Marco and um, Alexia as, and as well as Rob. We have looked at a few different uh, physical scenarios where you can um, naturally have this sort of resource constraints that lead to an increase in the noise per physical component as you scale up. Okay, we have sort of a, a couple of toy models that you have here, and then at the end, you also have an actual um, physical system where you have, uh, say, a qubit in a waveguide, and you have some sort of an energy constraint. Okay, we also worked out the situation where you have an area constraint, which means that your qubits are placed closer and closer together, and you hence have some sort of a crosstalk situation. Huh? Okay, and then in every single case, we can look at what is the maximum um, attainable computational accuracy. So that's sort of the bad news part of it. Huh? That because of the scale dependence of the noise, something that actually violates the original idea of fault tolerant quantum computing, actually it just means that you are not really having a technology that is completely scalable yet. But uh, this is where we are at the moment, and it's quite likely that this will remain true for quite a while. So as long as you are here, there is going to be a maximum attainable computational accuracy. Yeah, and what you see is that rather than having the standard fault tolerant quantum computer that just tells you computational accuracy on one axis, computer size on the other, I just need to make my computer larger in order to make my computer more accurate. Okay, and this dotted line is what you have for the standard fault tolerant quantum computation. This grows without end. The reality will be that you're going to follow one of these red lines instead, okay? So where you increase your computer size, your fault tolerant quantum computing works uh, for a little bit, and then you hit this situation where you have this limit on your accuracy, and then it comes back down again, even uh, as you increase your computer size, okay? What you then need is some sort of a breakthrough in your uh, physical device to be able to get to a weaker scale dependence, and then you can follow one of these other red lines, and you go, um, Go, go up as you uh, improve your technology, yeah? okay? So one of the main lessons of this, of course, is that uh, you hear very often that experimentalists are targeting some fault tolerance threshold. They just need to get the noise below the threshold. That's, in fact, not sufficient. It's not that one magical number that you need to look at only. What is more important is that you need to also look at what is the scale dependence of your noise. How, is, how are you going to scale up? Is that scalability really such that you're able to maintain the noise per component, even as you go to a larger device? Huh? Okay. And it turns out in some of the examples that we have worked through, the requirements for accurate computation turns out to be much, much more stringent when you have a scale-dependent situation. The good news part of it, this is the part that I'm actually not going to talk about. I'm going to uh, skip a little bit here. Okay. The good news part of it, I'm uh, using the pictures that I'm sure Marco will show again later. The good news part of it is that because I have this formula that relates the accuracy, the noise, and then the resource that you need to use, uh, I have this relationship. What you can use it is that now I want to think about the problem where I am uh, fixing my computational accuracy. I have some target computational accuracy okay, for my given problem. Then what you then do, and of course your physical device has some certain uh, amount of noise okay, with its own uh, scale dependence properties. Then what you can do is that you can think about minimizing the resource. Yeah? Okay? And this I refer you to uh, Marco's talk later where he will tell you about a full stack whole qubit uh, computer is really a superconducting qubit if you like. But you can see all the ingredients that go into that calculation where you really need the full stack picture of all the ingredients that go into your quantum computing stack. And then you need the error correction pieces that gives you the fault tolerant quantum computation that allows you to scale up your uh, error correction and hence hopefully increase your accuracy. Yeah? Okay. The punchline of this whole thing is the, the fact that, because if you ask any fault tolerant quantum computing person, they will just tell you, well, yes, you have some target accuracy. What you need to do is you just figure out what is the uh, scale that you need, what is the k value that you need, okay? And you minimize the k value so that you also minimize the physical resources that you need. Huh? But 
what Marco will hopefully uh, convey to you later on is the fact that actually the optimization is uh, a lot more complex than that. It's not just about minimizing K alone. You find that when you put in your actual physical model that includes like the qubit temperature, the, cu the temperature of your classical stages, some sort of attenuating factors, you can put in all of these things into one single package and then you really optimize, you're not going to get the same answer as just directly uh, minimizing K and then forgetting about all the physical parameters. Huh? The actual optimal answer is a lot more uh, complicated than that, that actually involves the physics that you have for your device. Okay. In the last three minutes or so, let me quickly go to the metrology things um, and really now think about uh, energy cost in uh, a quantum metrology setting. So. Actually, we came by this because uh, my postdoc, Ying Long, who's sitting there, had done a previous postdoc that was on quantum metrology. And then we had this, uh, together with Alexia, we had this sort of uh, energy constraint kind of idea. So we put the two pieces together. And let me tell you a little bit about the preliminary results. These are preliminary because uh, I figured with this conference being more of trying to start up collaborations and stuff, I'm hoping to get some feedback, some people who might be interested in uh, thinking about such questions together further. So the standard um, problem that you have for metrology is really, I mean, you try to do some sort of phase estimation, okay? In our case, we're talking about two-mode optical system, right? You have one mode here that is actually passing through some phase element, and then you have another mode that acts as the phase reference, and you measure the thing together. Huh? The usual case this arises is something that looks like some sort of interferometer, where you put in your input state here, the two modes are actually the two arms, and then you do some uh, measurement at the end, okay? The usual way you quantify this sort of uh, metrology scheme, how good it is, is really using quantum fissure information. Okay? And here we are really talking about the potential for your uh, metrology scheme given some input state beside in. Okay? Um, I'm not yet talking about optimizing uh, over, I mean, for a given M, I'm not yet talking about the actual fissure information that you get. I'm talking about the quantum fissure information where you're talking about uh, some given input state and then you optimize over all possible M values. Yeah? And of course, the larger the quantum fissure information, the larger is the optimal accuracy that you expect to get out of your uh, particular scheme. And the usual way people will write papers about this, uh, talk about the quantum fissure information, is that they will compare the quantum fissure information for all the different input states that they are inventing for these purposes. And, uh, but what they give fix is that they give you a fixed number of photons and uh, average number of photons inside your optical state that you're preparing. Yeah? Okay? So for example, people will talk about the coherent states, the standard things that come out of your laser, to have a quantum fission information that uh, is proportional to n, the number of photons, average number of photons. Then they will invent non-classical states like the noon states, some kind of squeeze states, uh, cat states, whatever. That, uh, and they will say that you win the game if you have a quantum fission information that actually scales uh, better than this n. In fact, this will, very often you will talk about scaling as n squared, which hits this so-called Heisenberg limit for quantum majority. Yeah? And that's usually what people talk about as the, the non-classical quantum enhancement. Now, um, what I always uh, complain about a little bit about this is that you're talking about very non-classical states and they are usually extremely difficult to uh, produce these states, okay? And I want to now ask about really what is the resource cost of producing these states and we want to make a comparison, not just talking about quantum fission information versus N, but I want to talk about quantum, quantum fission information per resource that you put in to produce these states. Huh? So if Lorenzo will give me another minute or so, the last uh, slide I will show that has content is really this picture that we have, uh, like I say, it's sort of our initial calculations with some of the states that we have explored. This is the usual picture where I have quantum fission information uh, divided by the number of photons and then plotted versus number of photons, okay? The number of photons is all inside the probe state that you are sending in. Huh? Okay, and you have this picture where the coherent state, the boring one, so-called classical version of this, it stays flat because this one actually is 2N for the scheme that I was doing. And then you have fancier states like the two-mode squeeze states, which is what this paper uh, from Pantheon group 
had actually produced. So two more squeeze states, of course, shows a much better QFI divided by N. Okay, I'll tell you about dotted line a little bit. And then there are the other side of it, which is really the so-called noon state. I write it as approximately equals to noon state because actually uh, what this paper has shown is that by mixing a coherent state with a uh, squeeze state through a beam splitter, you can produce a state that has very close, very high fidelity with a noon state. Huh? And noon state is one of these things that are known to give you this Heisenberg limit. So if you look at this graph, then you have the noon state uh, that goes up really quite rapidly. It's even better than the two mode squeeze state. You can even add in a little bit of losses and you'll find that uh, even in that case, the noon state situation still remains significantly better than your classical situation. Huh? Okay. Now, what we did was uh, we tried to replot the entire graph. Now, not versus n. Okay. Oh, sorry, this was n here. I covered now in my graph. I'm not plotting it versus n anymore. I'm plotting it versus wc, which is really what uh, Alexia uh, uh, suggested to call this work credit which is really the amount of energy you need to invest to produce the state that you want. Okay, so that's what work credit is. Uh, the amount of energy you need to invest in the preparation of your non-classical state that you're interested in. Uh. Okay, now we plot rather than WC, uh, rather than N here, I plot QFI divided by WC. And what you see is that the picture is rather different now. Okay, the coherent state still stays flat. Okay, and then what is perhaps surprising is that the two more squeeze state is now all the way at the bottom, yeah, compared to this situation where your two more squeeze state is really going up, yeah, and it's actually significantly better than the coherent state. Okay, and then uh, these two uh, sort of noon state-like thing, uh, they still do a little bit better, but there's sort of a caveat to it now. So there are a couple of things to this that let me um, let me give me a minute. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Let me just tell you about uh, what these uh, these lines, why these uh, these changes that's going on. The two more squeeze states here sort of remains at zero because you need to remember how you produce a squeeze state. Yeah, you produce a squeeze state usually by having a very strong pump beam with some sort of nonlinear crystal. The nonlinear uh, crystal, the coefficient, your chi square is usually extremely tiny. You need to pump your nonlinear crystal very hard to be able to give you the squeeze state that you want. Okay, so that WC, the energy uh, that you put into producing the state that you want, goes really, uh, it comes really from that very strong pump beam that you put, need to put in. Yeah? So you take that into account, you take your coefficient information per squeeze state that you produce, divided by the amount of energy that you put in for the pump beam, you're going to get something that is essentially flat. Yeah, okay. This is in fact also true for this situation of the because you are also using a squeeze state here, okay? If I had uh, just talk about the squeeze state part of it, actually you will find that the graph also stays essentially flat, just as your two mode squeeze state would. But let me review a little bit more about what goes into this graph. And that's actually that for these two states, uh, I should just look at the black one because the blue one is just with loss, right? The, the black state, what is happening is that I'm allowing myself, because I have a lot of energy, uh, WC is given to me, okay? I can actually decide how much energy I want to invest to put into the squeeze state portion. I can also think about how much, maybe I don't want to put all of it into the squeeze states, I want to put some of it into the coherent states, okay? And this is what this is actually showing. From the graph comes from me looking at each WC, a given WC value, and then I optimize the fraction that I will assign to the coherent state part versus the part that we state. Okay, so <clears throat> as you go down to this WC value, the coherent state fraction actually right at the beginning, most of the energy is actually in the coherent state and not in the squeeze state. Yeah. Towards the end, you will find that, uh, well, the coherent state fraction gets down to something like 0.3 or so, but it never, never actually goes to zero. Yeah? And you find that if you don't allow yourself to put any energy into the coherent state fraction, the graph don't, doesn't look like this at all. Actually, it just stays completely flat on the coherent state portion. Yeah? Okay? So I said this is preliminary. Because actually, what I wanted to mention here is all the different elements that we're now thinking about. 
this situation where you need to put in a work credit, you need to invest some initial energy to be able to produce the state that you want. And then since you have that amount of energy already, you might as well think about maybe I shouldn't put it all into producing my expensive states. I just put it uh, part of it into this coherent state situation that's so easy to produce and actually doing not bad. Yeah, okay. There's also the other side of this where you need, why we call it work credit and not actually energy use is because this work credit is actually a piece of thing that you will say that I invest early on. And then if I think about completing the thermodynamic cycle, I can recover that energy because the pump beam energy, most of it is actually, uh, it just passes through the nonlinear crystal. Yeah? So you can actually think about recycling that pump beam portion of it. And what this says to you is that if you really want to do it this way, okay, if you really want your two mode squeeze states to perform well, what you need to do is absolutely you need to be able to recover that pump beam energy that you put in. You need to think about recycling. Yeah? Okay. okay, so let me just end with that and uh, flashing just the people that worked on this. Yeah, thank you. Thanks a lot for the nice presentation. Are there, yeah, quick question. Okay, I'll come. Hello. Um, you talked a lot about this uh, error scaling uh, with the size of the computer. I wonder whether you, uh, whether you could uh, talk a little bit about history, if you know, about how this was resolved in classical computers or if there is something uh, like that in classical computers. Sorry, uh, I didn't hear the last part of it. Can you repeat um, the, the question again? In classical computers, does the error also scale with the size of the system? And if yes, how was this solved? Uh, does you the, did you ask if the logical error also scales? Yeah. Ah, in the classical computer, does this also scale? Actually, I have no idea. Um, that's a good question. Uh, my guess would be that probably it does at some very, very slow, uh, small level, but not sufficiently that you need to worry so much about this. Okay? Because we are talking about 50, 60 years of uh, technology going into that compared to whatever we have here that is a very nascent technology. No? Yeah? Okay. So just to follow up on, on that. so. Yeah. Uh, in the future, I guess, all of the scaled-up quantum computer will have a modular architecture. And I don't really see so much the scaling, you know, of noise there, that it really increases with the size of the system. There will be some increase, but I would say it's very small, and that's also the reason why classical computing, we don't have it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you for that. I often uh, get this comment, and I'm absolutely agreeing with it, and this is my... Just having, you know, it comes, it comes and goes. <laughs> the microphone hates me, no? Yeah. So when you talk about scalability, you're not just talking about making more and more qubits, right? What is, uh, of course, understood by everyone, and I'm just emphasizing this point, is that you need to be able to make more and more qubits without incurring this increase in the noise. And absolutely, the modular system way is what I would also uh, suggest for all of us to go for. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so let's... Uh, uh, schedule. Yeah, so I don't want to cut the thing short, but maybe we should move on. And, and I think Hui Kun can answer offline. Uh, so thank her again. Yeah, thank you.